Good morning, Rochester. I'm Stacey Henning, and this is Eyes on the Future. Today, we're discussing New York State's new paid family leave policy going into effect January 1st, 2018. And here in the studio with me this morning to talk about this very important policy is Luke Wright. Luke is a labor and employment attorney, as well as a senior associate at Harder C. Crest and Emory, where he focuses on helping employers solve employee-related problems while navigating labor and employment law. Sounds like a huge job there, Luke. Good morning. Thanks for making the time to be here this morning. Yeah, thanks, Stacy. Thanks for uh, having us here. It's good to be here. And um, I appreciate your sense of humor. We're having some fun before the show, so I'm sure this is going to be a great conversation this morning. And I, I liked what you posted on LinkedIn this morning. It's live radio. What could happen, right? Yeah, no pressure. No, no pressure, pressure at all. I've been doing this more than eight years. We're going to have a great time this morning. No worries. And our second guest is Jamie Von Bramer. Jamie is a vice president of HR consultant at HR Works, where he oversees consultants who work at local employers as their human resources representative. Good morning, Jamie. Good morning, Stacy. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad I found you guys this morning. That was the only hiccup we had before the show, was connecting with each other, figure out where you guys were. So now we're here in the WAM 1180 studio, and the show is uh, sponsored by the Max and Marion Fair's Charitable Foundation, Mengel Metzger Bar, Hard to See Crest and Emory, and Greater Rochester Enterprise. If you have a question, give us a call at 1-800-295-1180 or 222-1180. Luke, please share some insight into what this new paid family leave policy is all about. Yeah, uh, Stacy. so what we're talking about today is New York's new, uh, exciting paid family leave benefits law. You probably remember in 2016, uh, way back then, to much fanfare, Governor Cuomo signed this law. It was one of the keystone elements of the budget in 2016. And when it's fully implemented in uh, 2018, starting January 1st, it will provide the uh, one of the most generous paid family leave benefits in the country here in New York. Essentially what it did was it amended the current workers' compensation law so that now New York has workers' compensation benefits, disability benefits, and now paid family leave benefits. And you notice there's an extra word in the paid family leave benefits, and that's the leave part. So what this law does is give employees who need leave for one of these covered reasons we'll talk about guaranteed time away from work and a generous pay benefit for that time. And we'll talk throughout the hour of all about the policy, how people can execute it you know, for their team, who's eligible, what type of life experiences qualify you for this type of policy benefit, correct? Right. Yeah. So we'll have some fun this morning. It's very important. You know, I love the show because these are things that I wasn't really aware of. And I, I hope that our listeners will learn something new this morning as well that will help them improve the environment for themselves and their company. Uh, because Luke is here, I get to read this fabulous disclosure statement. So bear with me for a second. I'm sorry, Stacey. Um, you know, I, I asked you to read it, but you said I, I get to read it. So the views expressed by the attorney on this show are intended for general information purposes only and should not be considered as legal advice for the caller or the listening audience. No attorney-client relationship is created with Harder C. Crest and Emery by discussions on this show. Callers and listeners should consult with legal counsel to determine how applicable laws relate to specific situations. If you have a question this morning regarding paid family leave, please give us a call at 1-800-295-1180 or 222-1180. You know, I keep thinking I need to record that disclosure in advance and then compress it like they do on those TV commercials mm-hmm. for radio. I mean, for um, for car um, ads. I think that would be helpful to <laughs> me. Uh, Luke, what prompted the introduction of the paid family leave policy? Well, like I said before, it was one of the keystone elements of the 2016 budget here in New York. And you probably remember, our listeners probably remember, and uh, all of the discussion around Uh, the 2015-16 primary elections going into the uh, general presidential election. This was something that was talked about there. In particular, the Democratic candidates were talking about, we need some kind of national maternity paid leave. We need some type of stronger paid benefit leave. Uh, America, they would say, lags behind other developed countries. We're not as generous with uh, new moms in particular. Uh, And some states here in the United States have already passed laws like this. For example, New Jersey, uh, they have similar laws uh, picking up on this and and that it's a a great uh, talking point. And who can't get behind a benefit for new moms, right, new parents to spend time with their child? Uh, New York said, we'd like to be at the vanguard of of these developments and, and these laws. And so they proposed this paid family leave benefits law starting in 2018, but they passed it 
in 2016. So there's a perceived need for additional protections, uh, in particular for employees of smaller, uh, of smaller employers, uh, where there is really a hole in the legal protections. And it's uh, much broader than just maternity leave, right? Uh, Jamie, what types of leave are covered? Right, good point. Uh, so Luke mentioned the, the need to bond with a new child, but that could be due to birth, uh, foster care, um, you know, with uh, adoption potentially. So employees can take time off for that. Also, they can take time to care for a family member with a serious health condition, and we'll go through some of the, the type of people would be a qualified family member that you'd be able to take that time off for. And then also you can take time to leave um, – you could take leave to assist with family obligations when a family member is called to active military service. So there's a few different ways that an employee could potentially take advantage of this paid family leave. So to take care of a child? Correct. You could take care of a loved one who's sick? Correct. And your own illness as well? No, not no? your own okay. illness. So that's going to be disability insurance still, and that's uh, actually an employer would have to still have that coverage in place. Uh, but that is external to uh, what we're talking about today, which is the paid family leave. But that's right. It, it would not be for somebody's own individual disability. Okay. So what's the difference between the new policy and the Family and Medical Leave Act? Well, Jamie just mentioned uh, one of the big differences, I think, and that's the Family Medical Leave Act covers a few additional reasons, right, to take the leave. Uh, and one of those would be for your own serious health condition. So if you have a serious health condition, a dis disabling condition taking you out of work, you'd be eligible for Family Medical Leave Act under federal law. FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, is a, a federal law. Uh, so that's one thing. Some of the things, that uh, the events that are covered will be the same, right, to care for a, a parent or a spouse or a child. Some will be different. The New York law is a little more expansive as far as who, what family members are covered. Uh, the New York law will cover care of a grandparent or a grandchild, or a parent-in-law. So those are family members that the federal law doesn't cover, right? So if, if you're in a situation or you have an employee in a situation where they are caring for a sick grandparent, well, no Family Medical Leave Act leave, but yes, New York paid family leave once that kicks in. There are some other overarching differences that kind of gave rise to this feeling that there was a hole in the protections offered to employees who need this type of leave. Uh, one being that the Federal Family Medical Leave Act law only applies to larger employers. It only applies to employers with 50 or more employees, right? So there's this whole group of smaller employers that aren't covered under the federal law at all. The state law will cover all private employers, right? So no matter how small you are, if you're required to provide disability benefits under New York law, you will be required to provide paid family leave benefits. So it'll give uh, this type of leave benefit to a whole new group of people. Another big difference is money, right? Family Medical Leave Act leave under federal law is unpaid. You're, you're protected in your job. You can take the time away from work, uh, but there's no money involved. New York paid family leave is a paid family leave benefit. And so employees will be eligible to receive you know, up to a half and, and later two thirds of their salary while they're out on paid family leave. But they're paying it in to that's right. That's right. It's not something their employer has to pay. Right. So some right? states have dealt with this in a way where they say, look, if you have somebody who's going out on leave, we're going to going to make you pay them. Right. Like vacation or PTO. What this law does is it's really an insurance scheme like disability, like workers compensation here in New York, where we say, look, we pay into this fund. And when you need it, you get paid, whether it's from the employer as a self-insurer or an insurance carrier from the state. You know, and, and that's going to be funded by employees. What are the qualifying care and medical conditions under the paid family leave policy, Jamie? Right. So those serious health condition, uh, that term is actually really important. So uh, when we're talking about serious health condition, it's actually not, we're not talking about colds or coughs or basic illnesses that your mother or father or your grandparent, you know, may have. We're really talking about things such as an illness, injury, impairment, or physical or mental condition that involves inpatient care in a hospital or a facility um, with continuing treatment by your healthcare provider. So there's gonna be um, documentation that needs to, be, to come from a doctor. You're not gonna be written out to, to take advantage of this paid family leave for just the basic things. It's really gonna have to be something serious. So I think a good example would be an employee needing to take time off if uh, a parent has been diagnosed with cancer recently. They're gonna be able to have that time to spend with their parent to um, take them to appointments, take them to treatment. So that's really where the, where the value is for an employee. Um, but right, they're gonna have to have uh, that reason being a serious health condition. 
does an employee have to give advance notice? Yes, actually they do. Uh, one of the regulations state that um, they have to give at least 30 days advance notice for what we call a foreseeable leave. So if you want to bond with your child and you feel like it's really, you know, next month or two months down the road, you want to do that, you need to give your employer advance notice. And the reason being is that's going to give them a chance to shuffle schedules, get some coverage, things like that. Um, but if there's a need for a sudden leave, they all the all the regulations state is that it has to be as soon as practicable, which means as soon as possible. So it, yeah, it because, could happen pretty quickly. Uh, you can slip on a banana peel pretty darn quickly, right? Right. I mean, yeah. And if that I, takes you for an overnight stay, leave is covered. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, because thirty days is a long time. Podcasts of Eyes in the Future are available at rochesterbiz.com. What does the paid family leave policy mean for employers? We'll discuss when Eyes in the Future returns on News Radio Wham 1180. I'm Stacey Henning, and this is Eyes on the Future. We're talking New York's paid family leave policy this morning with Luke Wright of Harder Seacrest and Emory and Jamie Von Bremer of HR Works. If you have a question, give us a call at 1-800-295-1180 or 222-1180. Luke, when will employers have to have this in place? Well, so uh, the firm deadline to offer this type of coverage when it really takes effect is January 1st. 2018, right? So even though the law was passed way back in 2016, it doesn't actually benefit the employees or or place this obligation on employers until 2018. Before that, employers, of course, are going to have a lot to think about. They're going to have to have the coverage in place to provide the benefit uh, going in to 2018. And they'll have to make some decisions about how they're going to provide that coverage. They're going to have to have a a written policy in place and and display some notices. And we'll learn more about what those obligations might be as the Workers' Compensation Board finalizes its guidance on this law. When is that expected to come out? Well, so the the Workers' Compensation Board published uh, at the end of February what are are called proposed rules, right? They're rules out for discussion and review how they think the law should be administered. Uh, comments would be due on those rules by maybe employers or employees or attorneys uh, taking a look at these uh, by uh, the beginning of April. And then the Workers' Compensation Board will think about those comments and and what they've heard and what the feedback is. And they would issue uh, final rules some point after that, but before January 1st. Eyes on the Future is sponsored by Canandaigua National Bank and Trust, the Simon Business School, AP Professionals, and CDS Life Transitions. Who's paying for the paid family leave? Well, so the law says, I think I, I'm going to use air quotes, right? But the law says- Yeah, we says, can't see that here on the uh, radio, but just visualize <laughs> it. Yeah. Okay, good. The, the, the law says no employer shall pay for the benefits uh, provided under the paid family leave benefits law, right? So uh, what that means is it's going to be funded by a pay deduction from employees. Some employers, employees uh, already see this deduction or the type of deduction for disability benefits, right? Employers are allowed to take up to 60 cents a pay uh, from or per week from employees to pay for disability benefits. This benefit, though, the paid family leave benefit, will be funded entirely by employees, uh, at least at first. Uh, and we don't know what that deduction will be yet, though. Uh, that deduction is due to be released by June 1st of 2017 by the Superintendent of Financial Services. There's been some talk maybe a dollar, maybe two dollars, but we don't know yet. Okay, so it's like a, a cup of uh, my uh, favorite Tim Hortons iced tea every week. That's every not, week. It's not, yep. that's, it's, it shouldn't be that much of a shock to the bottom line. For, yeah, and that'll for, be it first, and we'll see how it goes, right? Is that enough for the insurance carriers to make money on offering this coverage? We, we just won't know right away. I mean, granted, you just said that the employee will be paying for this coverage, but there is a cost, right? Jamie, to the employer. Absolutely. Yeah. The the payroll deduction will come from the employee. However, every employer is still going to incur some cost. And we've got to find somebody that's within our organization that's going to spend time learning about the new regulations, uh, ensuring that the company's in compliance, taking the time to to do those tasks. Uh, There will be administrative responsibilities, including tracking leave, you know, shuffling coverage. Supervisors are going to spend time doing that, Um, you know, managing schedules, also, just within the payroll function itself, getting those payroll deductions set up correctly. So there's going to be a lot of behind-the-scenes tasks that with any leave or law that employers are required to follow, you know, somebody within the organization is really going to have to manage that and make sure everything's done accurately and timely and, 
and in compliance with the law. And obviously you needed that employee, so you'll have to figure out who's going to cover their work while the person's out. Right? right, right. So what does that mean? We're going to outsource and bring in somebody temporary to fill that role? Is there you know, somebody that can absorb some more work in the workplace? But right, that has to be managed and figured out, which obviously takes time, which costs money. And it looks like we have a caller on the line. Good morning. Welcome to Eyes on the Future. Yes, hi. I was interested in knowing how this um, this law interfaces with other laws, such as the unemployment insurance. Uh, say, for example, um, if you have a company that has like one or two employees, and one the employee takes advantage of the leave, then leaves. Uh, assuming the company couldn't survive suspension of business activities, would have to bring in a, a temporary worker or hire somebody else to do those at work. Once the original employee returns and the company has to terminate the replacement worker, does this law provide protection for the employer to not suffer the negative consequences uh, on the unemployment insurance side of the house? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the, and the short answer is no. Uh, so what would happen in that case, right, is as a smaller employer who is not used to dealing with these types of protected leaves, you know, that one or two, the one employee of a maybe three employee company would go out and that leave would be protected right there, entitled to come back to their job when they're done bonding with a child or caring for a sick relative. Uh, whatever we do to replace that person, uh, you know, they still would be subject to all other employment laws if they're an employee and if they work long enough and they're eligible for unemployment benefits, they'd be entitled to those benefits when they go out. So there could be an impact that way. You know, it also, uh, there is sort of an interaction with disability benefits law, workers' compensation law, unemployment. You know, you wouldn't be able to both receive paid family leave benefits and benefits under those laws, right? So if an employee is out on their own disability, they're collecting disability benefits leave, they couldn't at the same time collect paid family leave benefits. All right, excellent. So, so I understand that, you know the employee would get the unemployment benefits, but um, am I correct in assuming that when a company uh, or when an employee e files for unemployment benefits, that it's like a negative negative impact against the employer in the insurance yeah. scheme, so that their rates go up? Yeah, it would impact your or, it would impact the employer's account in the same way as any other. There's not sort of an uh, an out built in that would there would be an exception there. Are you aware of any efforts to try to correct that uh, obvious injustice? Uh, I'm I'm not uh, aware of any, but you know there are there is an opportunity to comment on the proposed uh, regulations coming out from the Workers' Compensation Board. But of course, that's a different agency. Uh, you know, the Department of Labor would be the ones dealing with unemployment, uh, and so uh, you know they would be the ones that we would want to talk to about about that issue. Well, you spoke about uh, the panel. Good show. Thank you so much for calling in. You talked about the panel. Of, you know, to respond to the po proposed policy, would this be something they could bring forward there? Yeah, it could be. There could be a comment there, but I don't think that it would end up addressing the unemployment issue just because it's a different agency you dealing could, with the. Could you hire a contractor then? Like, you could hire a contractor. You'd always want to be careful about making sure that relationship is a true contractor relationship. Reminder that podcasts of Eyes on the Future are available at rochesterbiz.com. We'll continue talking about the new paid family leave policy and what it means for your business when Eyes on the Future returns after the news on News Radio Wham 1180. Welcome back. Time now for the second half of Eyes on the Future. I'm Stacey Henning. We're talking about New York State's new paid family leave policy this morning with Luke Wright of Harder Seacrest and Emory and Jamie Von Bramer of HR Works. Eyes on the Future is sponsored by the Max and Marion Ferris Charitable Foundation, Mengel Metzger Bar. Those guys are working hard. It's tax season. The parking lot's full. Yeah, I saw some people running in today for yeah. going into that office. Yeah, nice shout out to them. They're great guys over there. Gave us some great tax advice a couple weeks ago. Harder Seacrest and Emory is also a sponsor in Greater Rochester Enterprise. If you have a question for the show guests this morning, give us a call at 1-800-295-1180 or 222-1180. Luke, what's the number one thing employers really should be thinking about right now with regards to the new paid family leave policy? Yeah, I think the first thing, Stacy, is this is coming. Right? This is something that's going to be on the horizon for January 1st, 2018. So the time to start thinking about it is now. I think that employers should have internal discussions about how they're going to deal with it, how they're going to provide this benefit, and think about what, are, what is it that the employer does right now 
for employees who need this type of leave to care for a family member, to have a newborn? You know, what benefits do they provide? How does PTO work with it? And how are we going to integrate that all together with the state benefit? Probably the most important thing, though, is the legal requirement. They're going to have to provide this coverage. PTO, paid family. Paid, paid time off. Paid time off. I was just call it vacation. <laughs> Crazy me. Jamie, how might employers obtain required coverage for paid family leave? Sure. There's a couple different ways. Uh, New York State is, is expecting the current disability insurance carriers to offer uh, paid family leave uh, insurance coverage to employers. So that's going to be in conjunction with the disability insurance they're already expected to carry. So an employer can, can certainly reach out to their current disability insurance carrier and start to ask some questions. Uh, other employers simply can choose to self-insure. You know, if they self-insure for disability insurance already, or even you know, certain certain employers will cover uh, and self-insure for medical insurance. Those employers might be apt to say, "Well, we're going to go ahead and self-insure for this." So again, uh, two two real options that that employers can choose from to offer the the mandatory leave insurance. Remind me who's required to provide this benefit, Luke. Yeah. So the short uh, answer, a way to think about this for employers is. If you are required to offer disability benefits under New York law, then you are required to offer paid family leave benefits under this law, right? Because they fall under the same rubric. Uh, and what that is, is basically every private employer in the state. And you, you notice I said private, right? So, He's smiling. <laughs> so what it doesn't cover is, is public employers, right? So the state, uh, the state subdivisions, municipalities, uh, those employers don't have to do this. As my kindergartner's class would say, you know, this is a choice time for the public entities, not a have to do. Uh, and so uh, the state and the state subdivisions, municipalities, they'll just have the choice. Do we want to provide this coverage or, or not? But for private companies, non-profit, it's a half, yeah. nonprofits, it's not a choice time. It's a have to do. It's a have to do. Yeah. And with the unemployment rate below 5%, what is it, 4.6, last I checked, you want to be an employer of choice, I think. You probably want to provide this kind of benefit to your employees. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it might be kind of an equalizer, Stacy, right? Because all employers, all private employers, will now be offering that, right? Whereas before, some companies could hold themselves out and say, look how generous we are. We provide this certain paternity or maternity parental leave time off to our employees. And now that might not be enough to differentiate you. As we were talking about earlier in the show, though, this is not something the employer has to pay for. The employee pays for this policy, correct? Right. You know, one exception to that might be, and Jamie mentioned, one option is to self-insure. And if an employer were to self-insure, you know, they're really limited to the amount of money they can take from their employees to pay for this. And so, you know, they may be, there might be a shortfall, right? You can take a dollar a week from your employee to pay for the benefit, but then there's a claim that comes in and it costs $650 a week. So there, you could see how if you have ten. Well, I'm not going to do the math, but you can see how there would be a. <laughs> you can you can see how there would be a shortfall. I'm not either. <laughs> you, there would be a shortfall there, and the proposed rules at least clarify. Look, if there's a shortfall and you're self-insured, you do have to pay the difference. Right. I also think it's important to note that uh, employers don't have the choice, but employees also don't have the choice for these private employers. Right. So the employees can't opt in or opt out of paid family leave and having that deduction come out. You know, they're going to have to have that deduction, and that's one of the rights of, of employers is to, to be able to take that deduction, and especially right. in the case of self-insurance. Yeah. Is there a way to prevent anyone from taking advantage of the paid family leave? Well, that's a great question. Uh, inevitably, that's going to be a challenge for some employers. You know, we want to assume that employers are going to use the leave for what it's intended. You know, they're going to follow the rules, but there's ultimately, you know, always someone that tries to game, you know, the system. So I would recommend there's a few different ways that you can try to prevent, as an employer, somebody from gaming the system. Uh, first is to have an expert on staff. You want to have somebody that really understands the rules and the regulations, the requirements, um, You know, it, whether it's internally or a consultant that you're working with, an employment law attorney that you're working with. Make sure that you know that, that somebody really understands the rules and regs. That, that way you can monitor and be sure to uh, you know, identify if somebody might be taking advantage or, uh, of the law. What's the most time an employee could actually take off under this new policy? Well, so when the policy is implemented, right, when the law takes effect in 2018, it will initially offer up to eight weeks of total leave for employees within any 52-week period. Then the law is scheduled to ramp up, right? So in 2019, it'll be 10. In 2020, it'll be up to 10 weeks. And in 2021, it'll be up to 12 weeks. The money ramps up, too. 
right? So it starts out as 50% of salary and gradually ramps up to uh, assuming that the carriers in the state, mm-hmm. we can afford it, will ramp up to two thirds of, of salary. Uh, and so, you know, maybe an example would be good if, if you have an employee now uh, who is expecting to deliver, would we know? Yeah, we would know this. Expect that I have a due date of January 15th, 2018 when paid family leave would take effect, that em- you would be talking to that employee and saying, look, when you give birth, you then can go out on leave. And for the first six or eight weeks, you can choose, are you disabled? Are you going to collect disability benefits? Or are you going to go right into paid family leave? And if the new mom says, well, I want disability benefits, six weeks, right, she might have as disability time, and she would get disability leave benefits from their the company's carrier, Right, one hundred and seventy dollars a week, and then after six weeks, she could start her eight weeks of paid family leave, which is a greater monetary benefit, half of her salary perhaps, and she could add that eight weeks to the six, and so she'd be able to take maybe fourteen weeks for having a new baby in two thousand eighteen. What's the biggest change employers should prepare for once the leave goes into effect, Luke? You know, I think it's it's this is a. I might call it, you know, the most significant change in New York employment law in in decades, maybe. You know, we get increased minimum wage. That's easy to deal with. It's not easy in the pocketbook, but easy uh, for an employer. Well, we just changed the wage. This adds a new administrative layer for employers and, you know, in particular, smaller employers that aren't used to dealing with the Family Medical Leave Act. Uh, and so they're just going to have to be aware that this is the law now. They'll have to offer the benefit. And it might be a loss of flexibility for some of those smaller employers where before they could deal with employees who need time away on a case-by-case basis. There will be more of a uniform requirement of this law uh, kind of imposed in a specific framework. Jamie, what kind of rights for employers should they be aware of when it comes to paid family leave? Sure. Well, they have uh, the right to, obviously, we've talked about it a couple times, but ha- to deduct the employee contributions. You know, employees can't say, hey, I don't want that money coming out of my paycheck. The employer will have the right to deduct that. Also, uh, any employees that are out on pet- paid family leave um, that have an employer, an employee contribution for health insurance, you know, if the employer is providing insurance, medical insurance to the employee and the employee is contributing to that, uh, the employer will have the ability to still um, get those contributions from the employee, whether that's through uh, you know payroll deduction or um, whether it's makeup pay after the employer returns from leave. And lastly, you know they really do have the right still to hold their employees accountable for following the rules of paid family leave. So we talked a little bit about preventing people from abusing uh, you know the leave. So the employers do have the right to to make sure that their employees are staying within the guidelines. And uh, if they're not, then they they may be able to take action. But I would say one caveat there is, you know, I personally see with with my clients and the employers that I work with, you know, they take it really personally when they feel like somebody's trying to take advantage of them and, and use the law to their advantage. And that can get, you know, personal pretty quickly. So my my recommendation is always to employers, if you feel like somebody's trying to take advantage of the system or something like that, you know, there are some non-retaliatory clauses within this law that you don't want to just, you know, make a quick decision to say, hey, you know, we're going to you know, try to try to uh, take this on with the employee right away. You probably want to talk to an employment attorney, um, somebody else as an expert before you you go to that degree of, of trying to take action against an employee just because you're you're thinking they're trying to take advantage. And, and one thing the employer always will maintain, at least so far, right, is you can always hold employees accountable for performance and behavioral issues that aren't related to using this benefit or taking the leave. So just because someone is scheduled to take the leave or has taken the leave, it's not a get out of jail free card for regular performance and behavioral issues. An employer, you know, maintains that right just to want would want to make sure they're being consistent in applying those rules. Could the policy actually take effect before January first, twenty eighteen? Uh, well, the policy could change, absolutely. So um, the Workers' Compensation Board, as Luke mentioned, is still accepting comments up until April seventh. Um, so I see the fact that, that they will review the comments, and I will. I definitely suspect that there will be some changes. So I, I think it will change uh, slightly before January 1st, 2018, but it, it won't change probably too significantly. Yeah, and what won't change is, uh, you know, unless something significant happens at the uh, state legislature, legislature level, uh, this is coming on January 1st, 2018. Some of the administrative requirements might tweak or change. But this benefit will have to be offered on that day, and that's not going to change. So if I have a medical um, 
condition are, you know, if something happens with someone in my family, God forbid, gets sick in December, yeah. and it straddles, you know, 2017 and 2018, would this um, activity actually qualify? That's a benefit? Stacy, what a tricky question ah, you've, you know. you've asked because you know that's interesting, right? The, the, the statute itself says any leave that starts before 2018 would not be eligible, right? But if you're talking about some kind of periodic leave, that probably would fall in. And what is definitely covered under at least the proposed rules, anyone who has a baby in 2017 can take bonding time for that baby in 2018 after the law is in effect. Podcasts of Eyes on the Future are available at rochesterbiz.com. Coming up next, Eyes on the Future returns to wrap up our great discussion on News Radio WHAM 1180. I'm Stacey Henning, and this is Eyes on the Future. We're wrapping up our discussion about New York's new, pay, new paid family leave policy this morning with Luke Wright of Harder Sea Crest and Emory and Jamie Von Bramer of HR Works. Eyes on the Future is sponsored by Canandaigua National Bank and Trust. Simon Business School, AP Professionals, and CDS Life Transitions. And we have a caller on the line. Good morning. Welcome to Eyes on the Future. What's your question for the panel? Uh, good morning. Good morning. I was just wondering if this whole law applies to part-time employees as well as full-time employees um, for the um, employer's contribution and the deduction from the employee's paycheck. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy, Stacey, that we have had callers where we have answers uh, for their <laughs> questions. And uh, yes, you know, this law applies to part-time employees. There's a little difference in the eligibility for, for part-time employees. If you're not working a full, you know, five-day-a-week schedule, you're not going to be eligible for this benefit as a part-timer until you've worked 175 days of work. Uh, but for the deduction, uh, that would be kicking in uh, right away. So you'd be paying for it immediately and eligible for it after you've put in 175 days of work. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for calling in. Thanks for holding on uh, during the commercial break, too. The caller had a point that, um, that I want to make sure we clarify. She mentioned the employer's contribution. But, in fact, this is actually something that the employee pays for, correct? Right. Yeah. I, I Sorry, I thought we were referring to the employee deduction is what we were talking about. But, yes, the employee deduction will start right away, even for a part-time employee. Uh, but the employer should not be making any contribution for this. Just recap for those who maybe haven't caught the entire discussion this morning. What Please re recap the new paid family leave policy and what it means for the employers. Yeah, starting January 1st, 2018, employers, uh, most employers in New York and all private employers are, will be required to offer and provide uh, paid family leave benefits to their employees uh, starting January 1st, 2018. Initially, this will be eight weeks of available paid time off for employees uh, similar to that administered under disability benefits, but this will be for bonding with a newborn or adopted or foster child that's been placed, uh, caring for a seriously ill family member, including grandparents and grandchildren and parents and spouses, uh, or for uh, military arrangements when a family member is called to active duty service. Is there a chance the policy might change given the current national political climate, Jamie? I really don't think so. Uh, I think the the regulations will change, as we've discussed, but I think paid family leave in New York State is here to stay. Luke mentioned earlier, there's five other states that have already been successfully offering paid family leave, including California, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Washington, the District of Columbia. So it just so happens New York State is, you know, the most generous. Uh, but I don't, I don't see even with anything going on at the federal level that anything's going to change within New York State. You know, one thing that we have seen uh, that could overlay this is I think we saw President Trump a few times on the campaign trail and in his address to Congress mention the idea that he may want some type of a paid family or paid uh, parental leave. And so we might see an additional requirement at some point. Who do you think really is uh, going to benefit the most from this, Jamie? Well, I think really the Gen Xers, the age 34 to 54 employee will probably benefit the most from this law from an employee perspective. You know, they'll be able to use, uh, take advantage of that paid family leave for, for all those reasons we've discussed, starting a new family, caring for parents or grandparents, having fam family members going to the military. But with that said, individually, I think it's, it's good to point out that new moms and dads will benefit, of course, but elderly parents uh, who need assistance from a son or daughter that's in the workforce, 
uh, that might not have been able to get as much time from them for assistance, really help them, uh, children with serious medical issues that you know maybe would uh, would uh, would have been a little bit more struggle to get mom and dad's time. Now they're going to have this job protected leave available to them to to help with children with serious medical issues. So. What's the biggest piece of advice you'd provide employers at this point, Luke? You know, I, I would just say to to start thinking about this right now. Uh, start looking at your policies and and your practices and determine how they might change. Uh, and also think about how you're going to get this coverage and implement it because that's the requirement that will be on you starting January 1st. Where do I get this coverage? You know, uh, I think, as Jamie had said, you want to probably first talk to your disability uh, benefits carrier. If, if that's how you obtain disability benefits insurance, they'll be required to offer you this benefit. So you can speak with them, see how much uh, it'll cost. Uh, eventually, we'll know that. And that would be the first place I'd go. Self-insured employers have a little more to think about. They're going to have to think about whether they want to self-insure for this more generous benefit and take on that cost and burden, or if they want to take the option to uh, go to a carrier uh, to provide the family side of that coverage. It looks like we have a caller on the line. Good morning. Welcome to Eyes on the Future. What's your question for our guests? I have a question about Family Medical Leave Act and allowing employees to take time off whenever they feel their medical issue is such that they can't go to work? Well, so, uh, you know, both this, I guess that's a, a slightly different issue than New York paid family leave, right? New York paid family leave will cover employees who need to care for someone else. Under the Family mm-hmm. Medical Leave Act, you know, there is the option for employees to not come to work for their own serious health condition. And sometimes that can be intermittent, right, from time to time if they can't come to work, if it's medically necessary. And, you know, employers do have tools to request verification of that condition. But once that condition's verified, a lot of times it's difficult for employers to say no to that, you know, and you often can't say no to that. And there's no repercussion for the employee. And the reason I ask this, I'm a physician, and I get asked this all the time, and it's difficult for me to say, yes, I think you can take time off whenever you want. Yeah, and we would, we would just hope that those forms are filled out as uh, honestly and as completely as they can be. Thank you so much for calling in. Final question for you guys. Where can an employer actually get information about this new paid family leave? Sure. Uh, www.ny.gov has got you know a really nice website, comprehensive, shows a lot of the information. It does look like it's actually, you know, it appears as it's final. <laughs> But it's not final to this point, but that's probably the best place that people can go and find more information. Reminder to our listeners that podcasts of Eyes on the Future are available at rochesterbiz.com. Thank you both so much for coming in today. I always learn something new on this show that makes me happy when I uh, can come in on a Saturday and learn something that makes me smarter. I hope our listeners feel the same way. This is Eyes on the Future. Every week we talk about what's being done to grow the economy.